Stan Gibalisco here. I'm going to continue the discussion about atmospheric radio wave propagation. I talked a little bit about how the ionosphere, the layers of the upper atmosphere that become ionized because of solar radiation, how those layers affect radio communication, particularly at the so-called short wave frequencies or the high frequencies as they're technically called, even though by contemporary standards the waves are not short and the frequencies are not high. However, on frequencies where the waves really are comparatively short and the frequencies really are comparatively high, particularly those frequencies above about 50 megahertz in ham radio terms that's the 6 meter band and above on these frequencies the lower the lower atmosphere of the earth the troposphere will affect propagation now remember the troposphere or troposphere is where all of our weather occurs and it extends up from the surface to roughly 8 miles near the poles and 12 miles near the equator. That would be what? Um, multiply by 1.6 to get kilometers. A, a good average figure is 10 miles or 16 kilometers. That is the depth of our ocean of air where all of the weather phenomena take place. Under certain conditions, uh, in fact, relatively common conditions, radio waves at frequencies upwards of 50 megahertz up to, oh, several hundred megahertz can propagate by means of tropospheric radio wave propagation. And there are three basic modes in which that can occur. Probably the most common is atmospheric scatter. Tropospheric scatter, also sometimes called troposcatter. The air molecules themselves, along with dust grains and water vapor droplets and things like that, water droplets I should say, not water vapor droplets, water droplets, and uh, occasionally other pollutants and things like that, will cause the radio waves to scatter in much the same way as visible light does. That's why the sky looks blue, because the atmosphere tends to scatter blue visible light more than it scatters red visible light. So we see red at sunset oftentimes when the sun's light has to go through a lot of air, but the sky itself looks blue. Have you ever seen uh, a certain kind of, well, just a certain kind of window tint in windshields of automobiles and it looks, the, the tint itself looks bluish green or green. And yet when you see a light pass through it, it turns more red. Sort of the same type of thing. And the same type of thing can happen with radio waves even up into very, very short wavelengths. 50 megahertz corresponds, as I said, to about 6 meters wavelength. Scatter can occur all the way up to only a few centimeters in wavelength, hundreds of megahertz, even into the gigahertz range. That is tropus scatter. Another mode that can occur is called tropospheric bending. That occurs when you get cool air near the surface which is more dense and then it warms as you rise. Now normally uh, you would expect that the air would get cooler as you increase in altitude but oftentimes you get what is called an inversion. I know that we get these, these thermal inversions or air temperature inversions quite commonly in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America so that while down on the prairies at altitudes of maybe 2,000, 3,000 feet, it might be 15 degrees below zero Celsius. Up here, it might be zero Celsius, 
even though we are at more on the order of 5,000 feet altitude, 2,000 feet, how many kilometers is that? How many meters is that? You, you tell me. But anyway, the fact that we are at a much higher altitude does not always mean that the air is going to be cooler. Sometimes it does, but not always. And when you get an inversion like this, you get a, a warm, relatively warm air here, and then it, eventually it will cool off again as you continue to increase in altitude so that if you f are flying in an aircraft at, say, 37,000 feet. I remember I was flying from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Honolulu, Hawaii, when I moved down there in 1999. I moved actually to the big island of Kona, and they had uh, temperature data and everything. They showed where our plane was and how high it was and exactly what direction it was facing and how fast it was going and what the temperature outside was, and it was in the 70 to 80 degree below zero Fahrenheit range. Well, <laughs> that's not warm, but sometimes you will get a cool layer, layer and it, it becomes warmer, and that's an inversion. The index of refraction of the air... The index of refraction of the air with respect to these radio waves therefore decreases as the air gets warmer because it's less and less dense. Remember, warm air expands, therefore under the uh, it becomes less dense generally. Also, in addition, as you increase in altitude, it gets less dense. So you get two effects conspiring together to create this kind of a lens effect. And it, and it tends to retain the radio waves if they are propagated at a low angle with respect to the surface. They will actually bend and return hundreds of miles away in some cases, hundreds of kilometers away. Tropospheric bending can uh, result in your hearing an FM uh, radio broadcast station, for example, from, oh, I don't know, Indiana when you're in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, or from Austin, Texas, when you are in Minneapolis. Occasionally, it will actually propagate for that great of a distance. So that is the second most common mode. And radio hams take advantage of this very commonly on the 6 meter and 2 meter, that is to say, 50 and 144 megahertz bands. Finally, we have a mode that isn't shown here because it w the diagram just would get too cluttered. But once in a while we will get a layer of cooler air sandwiched in between two layers of warmer air at a specific level, sort of like a stratified cool air sandwich. And when that happens we can get something called tropospheric duct effect or also known as ducting tropospheric ducting and that can result in dramatic communications between specific points provided that the antennas are at just the right altitude above the surface or the right height so that they are both in the same duct and you get kind of almost like a, um, well, it's not like a waveguide because it's too large to be a waveguide, but it's kind of like uh, like an echo chamber, an echo chamber, and your, wa your waves literally bounce back and forth between the two boundaries. Supposing, you know, imagine a cheese sandwich, and your radio waves are propagating inside of the cheese. That's the cool air in between the two layers of warm air, which would be the bread. So the radio waves can propagate inside that cheese duct for long, long distances and bounce off the interior surfaces, much the same way as an optical fiber works, much the same type of effect. Bending, in fact, and ducting both occur in optical fibers, but that's, uh, of course, at a much higher frequency and a much shorter wavelength. So that in a, well, I was going to say nutshell, but that would sound trite and inapplicable besides. Those are the modes of tropospheric propagation which are 
popular modes in amateur radio operation at very high frequencies particularly. Stan Jabalisco signing off until next time saying 73. My call sign is W1GV Whiskey 1 Golf Victor. You will find me primarily on the 20 meter band 14 megahertz using CW that's Morse code and phase shift keying PSK but primarily Morse code. That is my favorite, my favorite of all time mode. 73 once again and so long.